Principles of Macroeconomics, Chapter 10, The International Trade and Capital Flows, Professor Wagner. What's going to be covered in this uh, chapter are some rather interesting things, considering what's going on with tariffs and trade relations uh, across the globe, in particular U.S. and China. Uh, they're going to talk about trade balances, uh, in a, also in a historical and international context, trade balances, the flows of financial capital, uh, national saving, investment identity, pros and cons of trade deficits and surpluses, and the difference between level of trade and trade balance. You know, money is the uh, the currency of exchange. You know, although it may come in many different currencies, it's all backed by governments. It's all created by fiat, which means it's created and printed on the basis that the government will always be able to back their debt. Now that's true for more for some than let's say others uh, that's a discussion we'll ensue on a little bit later a trade balance is simply the difference between a nation's exports and imports so you can say there's a trade imbalance you know if you feel like the uh the prid quo quo aspect of it is the trade is you know the trade is not really equal you're importing much more than you're exporting or vice versa uh, in high income economies you know u.s goods comprise less than half the country's total production while services comprise more than half merchandise trade balance versus a current account balance and so these are three definitions so the merchandise trade balance balance of trade looking only at the ex exchange of goods Current account balance, a broad measure of balance of trade that includes trade goods and services and international flows of income and foreign aid. And then there's unilateral transfers, payments, you know, the like government, private charities, individuals will send abroad without any expectation of a return. Here we have a couple of graphs. Uh, the first graph, A shows the current trade account balance versus the total merchandise trade balance from 1960 to 2013 and if the lines are above zero dollars the u.s was running a positive trade balance and current current balance if it fell below zero just the opposite we were running a deficit and a deficit in the current account balance whereupon Graph B shows the same items, trade balance and current account balance in the relationship to the size of the U.S. economy or GDP. So there's a comparative added. A measure of economies globalization. So it's a function of the exports of goods and services as a percentage of GDP. Uh, the dollar value of exports divided by the uh, dollar value of a country's GDP. So, so this is a ratio. Trade balances in the flow of financial capital. So we can get a definition of financial capital being the international flows of money to facilitate trade and investment. Uh, the connection between uh, the trade balances, international flows of capital uh, is so that economists sometimes describe the balance of trade as the balance of payments. Each category of the current account balance involves a corresponding flow of payments between a given country and the rest of the world economy here we have a kind of a cyclical graph where you have uh, exports investments imports and investment income paid you have the home country you have the rest of the world so this is you know your country in relationship to global trade and so each element of the current account balance involves a flow of payment between countries top line shows exports of goods and services you know leaving the home country second line shows money receives for those exports third line it shows the imports that that home country receives from others and then the last line shows the payments that the home country sent abroad for in exchange the balance of trade is the balance of payments 
A current account deficit means the country is a net borrower. Conversely, a positive occurrence means that they are they are a lender. Uh, inflow, it, it is possible to be both. Um, an inflow or outflow of foreign capital does not necessarily refer to a, the debt that governments owe to other governments, although government debt may be part of the picture. Uh, these international flows of capital refer to the other ways in which private investors in one country may invest in another country, and this can happen in terms of buying real estate companies or financial investments like stocks or bonds. Uh, a point of note, this is not always a healthy uh, exchange, depending on what type of relationships people have with the other countries. So right now there's a phenomenon on the West Coast. In particular, where China's buying up real estate up and down the West Coast, uh, Vancouver, Canada, and British Columbia is a really great example. I was there a couple of years ago. Lots of really beautiful, tall buildings, very modern, very clean. Uh, and only to learn that most of those buildings were empty, and that was so that the Chinese could drive up the uh, costs of the rental market in that area. So. It's not always a benign exchange, and that's something you need to bear in mind. Sometimes tariffs or even embargoes may have to take place to get things back into shape. Here we have a little formula, probably we'll see it on the test, about national saving and investment identity, total private savings and public savings, or in this instance, a government budget surplus that happens every now and then. And so you have the supply of financial capital equal demand for financial capital. So those two things are meeting an equilibrium. And then you have your formula where you have this, the savings by individuals added by either imports or by exports. You also have the individual pr private sector investment, government spending minus taxes collected. Uh, probably we'll see this on a test once again. National savings and investment, identity continued. We'll go back to our formula. I think a couple notes on the bottom with uh, government is spending more than it's pulling in the way of taxes. They'll demand financial capital. So this is what happens with quantitative easing or let's just say simply a shortage of uh, cash for the government to conduct its business to either print more money or do a stimulus package and we've seen a lot of that in recent uh, years so that's something that you should become familiar with where are the opposite if we're collecting more taxes and the government's actually spending uh, we could be a supplier of financial capital which means we can use the money for other means, perhaps leveraging other countries to do our bidding or to give us favorable trade. And domestic saving and investment determine the trade balance. So they're talking about really the retail investor to, to a larger extent. So uh, economists view the balance of trade as a fundamentally macroeconomic phenomenon. Uh, in the case of a trade deficit, which is something that's constantly spoken of with respect to trade with other nations and the trade balance. Uh, the national savings and investments can be written as such. So you have this formula, it's a variant on what we were talking about earlier. So the only way that domestic investment can exceed domestic saving is capital flowing into a country from abroad. Domestic saving and investment. Okay, that's determining the trade balance in continuation. So in case of a surplus, uh, you have the formula down there. Domestic savings, both private and public, is higher than the domestic investment, meaning that money's basically just sitting in the bank. And extra financial capital would be invested abroad. National savings and investment identity also provides a framework for thinking about what will cause trade deficits to rise or fall. So this is a little bit predictive based on the behavior of several factors. Once again, we have our equation.
And so this is a case where you have a table where you have if domestic investment goes up and the savings doesn't change, the uh, difference between taxes and government spending does not change, it, then M minus X must drive. So this is a ceteris paribus situation where they freeze certain vegetables, I mean variables, and uh, uh, anyways, you'll see what, yeah, you probably need to see this on the test, I'd refer to this. In the short run, when an economy is in a recession or on the upswing, these things influence uh, balance and balances. A uh, recession tends to make trade deficits smaller or a trade surplus larger, while a period of strong growth tends to make the deficits larger and those trade surplus smaller. So they kind of behave inversely of each other. Okay, if to uh, the pros and cons of deficits and surpluses, really there's no economic merit or advantage of just being on the sidelines. It does make sense for a, com a national economy to borrow for, um, uh, from abroad as long as it puts the money to good use and it tends to raise the nation's economic growth over time. A couple of examples and the you know, the mid-1800s, the Industrial Revolution in the United States, the South Korea in the 70s, who have greatly benefited from this, whereas not everybody necessarily does this with the right goals in mind, or they say they're going to do something and wind up doing something different, so they get the, you know, results that Mexico, Brazil, and a lot of Africa had seen in the 70s and 80s. Most of these countries are pretty dilapidated from an economic standpoint. They have high inflation, they have you know, income inequality that's not even on par with what we're doing. So they have they have issues because they're not making prudent choices. So the difference between the level of trade and a trade balance, the level of trade tells how much production it exports. Okay, so the separate term then the balance of trade and that's measured as a matter of exports out of the GDP so it's a it's a ratio three factors that influence the nation's level of trade is the size of its economy its geography and its history so what would you think about the following countries having a low or high level of trade let's talk about you can talk about Sweden and Sweden amazingly has quite a high level of trade. You think of Volvo or you think of IKEA and a number of other things that, you know, really are global global brands. And so they do have quite a bit of participation in spite of their their size and really anonymity uh, because not everybody thinks of Sweden as a as a uh, economic powerhouse of any kind, but they are a developed nation, United States. Uh, we have a very high level of trade, and Japan most definitely does too. So some final takeaways about trade imbalances. Trade deficits could be good or a bad sign for our economy, and surpluses could be a good or bad sign. So there's no uh, imperative as to whether it's going to be one direction or another. There are other influencing factors that may impact its benefits or, or negatives on any given economy. Uh, trade balance is zero, which means we're hit a point of equilibrium where we're neither a borrower or a lender. It could also be a good or bad sign. So there's really a lot of ambiguity about this stuff. That's the thing you need to keep in mind. Um, you, you know, whether a particular country is borrowing or lending, uh, and the particular economic conditions of that country makes sense. So basically, you know, a prudent, you know, a prudent government or a prudent, you know, central bank would have take a look at the current economic policy, the productivity of the country, and try to adjust their policy to either promote growth or any number of factors. And these will be spoken of later. This concludes chapter 10.